on, everybody? Happy Sunday. Happy Memorial Day weekend. And i um, glad you're here. It's good to be um, back with you all. I don't take this for granted. Um, and also super excited to be beginning a new sermon series tonight that we are calling Backwards Gospel. And what we're going to be doing for the next six, eh, I don't know, maybe seven weeks, we'll see. Um, we're going to be going through the book of Galatians, which is found in the New Testament, and uh, kind of tearing it up chapter by chapter and chewing on the good meat that's there. And tonight I get to introduce kind of what this book is all about. But before I do that, uh, just to explain the title, because you might be like backwards gospel, what the heck is going on? So really quick, really brief, this letter is written in the New Testament, and it's to um, these Christians that had just received, well, they first received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel is this church word for good news, because Jesus' story is good news. It's always been good news. It still is good news, and it always will be good news. <laughs> Amen. Awesome. You guys are with me tonight already. I love it. So they received the good news of Jesus, and then there were these people that came in, and they preached what they called the gospel, but we'll see tonight, Paul's like, nope, that's not a gospel at all. It's not good news at all. So it's people that got the gospel backwards, but then Paul later explains what gospel living looks like, what living in grace looks like, what living a life by the Spirit or a Spirit-filled life you might have heard in the church. What does that actually look like? What does that mean? So Paul addresses all these things in six sweet chapters in a really kind of passionate and like pumped up way. It's amazing. It's going to be so much fun. So that is kind of the really like brief bio on Galatians. If that was the Insta bio, well, I would run out of characters. Oh, well. But here we go. Here's the who, what, where, when, and why. Background. I'm setting you up for the next six weeks. So you have to come back for the week's ahead, all right, because it will make a lot more sense, it'll be helpful, but uh, again, I want to I wanna set us up for success as we dive into Galatians, so let's just do a quick who, what, where, when, why. So who? This was written to Christians. This was written to Christians, and as I mentioned earlier, Christians who got the good news of Jesus confused with other news. It's important to remember, especially for tonight's reading, it's important to remember that this is written to Christians by Paul, because as you'll see in just a few moments, Paul has some pretty harsh words. Yeah, he, he's like straight up cussing people out in Galatians 1. It's kind of funny. So he has harsh words, but they are never directed at non-believers. They are never directed at non-believers. I think that this is just side observation. I think that sometimes we as a church can be known for the wrong things to the wrong people. We, we use harsh words towards non-believers when actually we should be using encouraging words towards non-believers and encouraging words towards believers to build each other up more and more towards Jesus. But Paul uses harsh words for good reason, which we will see in just a moment, because they are directed at people who have placed their faith in Jesus that are living a life contrary to the gospel that Paul initially preached to them. Again, important background setting because that is going to kind of set the tone for who is this written to. Now, what was being written? Galatians has been called as the theologian Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., different guy, also a great guy, but the theologian Martin Luther called Galatians the Declaration of Independence of Christian Liberty. Strong words. Galatians is a passionate letter. The outpouring of, this is what he also said. He said, it's the outpouring of the soul of a preacher on fire for his Lord and deeply committed to bringing his hearers to an understanding of what saving faith is. So what this letter contains is essentially a how to live by grace for dummies. Uh, to put it in modern context, it's really great. I need it. It compares and contrasts living under the law which has expired because of the Christ, because of the cross through Christ, I could speak English, versus living by grace and living a spirit-filled life. Where? This place called Galatia, if you really want to know, for all the Bible nerds in the building, it's in this province called Asia Minor. What's the big deal about that? Well, if you're a 
theologian, there's bigger deal about that, but I won't get into that tonight. But Paul wrote this letter um, to answer a threat to his status as an apostle and a teacher and to reaffirm the core message that faith in Jesus is the basis of membership in God's new community. Faith in Jesus, that's it. So when, this is also maybe for some of you history nerds, this is actually um, pretty important. When this is happening is pretty pivotal for the Christian church as a whole. Th again, this letter was written thousands of years ago. It's gonna be relevant to your today and to your tomorrow, I promise. But it, when this happened was at the time where um, Jewish Christians, so people that were previously uh, Jewish that maybe still were Jewish by, by custom and ethnicity had placed their faith in Jesus. But now at this point in church history, the Gentile Christians, which is essentially people that weren't Jewish before they believed and put their faith in Jesus, the Gentile Christians were now starting to outnumber the Jewish Christians. So this is really important as well because Paul is mad at a specific group of people. His opposers, his agitators, as he says in the text, are this group of people called Judaizers. And it was a group of legalistic Jewish believers. This would be the equivalent of people that maybe grew up in the church their whole life that were extremely legalistic. He's mad at these people who told people that were unchurched for most of their lives but placed their faith in Jesus that they had to practice Jewish traditions for their salvation to be complete. Essentially what these Judaizers were telling the church in Galatia was the cross was not enough. Salvation through Jesus and faith in him is not enough. You actually need to do these other things as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. So why was this letter written? Well, I kind of answered it for you a little bit right now. Um, but Paul proceeds to his main argument, which is that Gentiles who have become followers of Jesus do not need to follow Jewish traditions or customs. The new worldwide family, which had been promised to Abraham, is created by faith in Messiah Jesus. That is so important that we know this. It's created by faith in Jesus alone, not by keeping the Jewish law, which is called the Torah. You see, the Judaizers, they valued the law over faith, but Paul is saying, I value faith over law. And it's also important to know that Paul was a Jew himself. And, and we'll see next week when we get into chapter two, where Paul actually gives a little bit of his insta bio for us, where Paul's actually this really devout Jew, and he's saying, hey, it's not necessary that these Gentile Christians practice the same way that we do. And it's important because the biblical story including in the Old Testament, have been pointing to this all along, that faith is what counts us as righteous in God's eyes. But you might be wondering, like I did, if we're not following the law anymore, wouldn't there just be anarchy and chaos and disorder within the church? And we know that Paul is a guy of order as well from his other letters. And no, Paul says that not only is the Torah not the basis of the gospel, but Paul answers by describing what spirit-empowered life looks like in the community of Messiah followers. So Paul closes a letter, which we'll see in the final week, spoiler alert, of this series. He says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Stick with me the next few weeks. I'll explain what that means. Or you can ask your parents. Paul says, what counts is the new creation. All right, I'm going to pray and let's go. Jesus, thank you so much for your grace. Even right now as I'm preaching, man, your grace is covering me and it's, it's in me. And um, more importantly, God, we know that uh, you love it when we, we praise you. Um, God, that our praises earlier were sweet and pleasing. Um, to you. God, we thank you that there's nothing we could do to earn more of your love, fall out of it. But Jesus, by, by your good grace and by the work of the cross and the resurrection, 
that we are eternally secure in your firm grip. God, tonight I pray for um, each and every one of us here, Lord, that we will take these scripture verses, and again, may they not just apply to our Sunday night. If that's the case, I haven't done my job well. But God, I pray that these passages in just a few moments will change us eternally. God, that we will be continually shaped by your Holy Spirit to become more and more like you so that the world will know us as you said we should be known by, by your love, God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I have a big brother personality. And it's not just a big brother personality. It's because I am a big brother, if you didn't know this. So I'm the oldest of four kids. Um, I've had both the, the pleasure and the love of being the oldest sibling. And I've also hated being the trailblazer at times, if I could be honest. It, it's, it's been a love-hate relationship being the oldest child. Like my younger siblings... They wouldn't even know where they would be if it wasn't for me trailblazing ahead of them. All the, oh my gosh, I got an older sister over here saying, amen, that's true, I agree. And, and my siblings, you know, they, they might have taken things for granted for things that I've done, such as uh, my parents figuring out how to parent all happened with me first. And... Uh, what did that come with? That comes with, okay, how do we, how do we love a child well um, throughout his or her entire life and in different stages of life um, and the messiness when you're like a kid, but then you're a tween, then you're a teen, then you're still living at home for a little bit, maybe a little bit longer than they anticipated, and you're in college and, and you get back from college and you're living at home again and for a little bit. <laughs> And figuring all this out and, and then report cards as well and understanding how do we teach our kids to do their very best in school and to try to get the best grades possible without making them feel like they're the worst in the world if they don't get an A. Like just kind of things like this. And I had the pleasure of taking some of those blows for my younger siblings um, there, there are other things, there, there were good things about being an older brother, though. Like, for example, I've prided myself on teaching my younger siblings what to do and what not to do based on my life experience. So I've actually really enjoyed that. I've liked being the older brother in that way. More often than not, it was teaching them what not to do because I messed up a lot. Um, I don't know if anybody else can relate. Maybe not. You guys are all perfect angels. What am I talking about? God, know your audience, Rob. Come on. All right. Where was I? You guys are perfect angels. I'm not. Okay. Mistakes. Teaching what not to do. Yes. Teaching what not to do. Thank you. Um, but there were other things as well. Um, about being an older brother. Like, for example, I'm the oldest of four. The third one is my sister. So we do have uh, the saving grace of a female in the mix of three boys. Thank you, God, for sisters. Um, I'm pretty sure I still hold the world record for most punks chewed out on Instagram by an older brother for all these guys in high school that were trying to hit on my sister. They had no idea what was about to hit them next. Me, on Instagram, either commenting back right on the photo or privately DMing them. And guess what? When guys started mysteriously disappearing out of my sister's life, you could blame me. Not, I didn't do it like Italian job style. It was, <laughs> come on, calm down, calm down. It was, I just had to let them know, hey, you don't mess with my sister you treat her with respect. You don't talk to her that way. I'm watching, okay? That's right. I will let them know. I still let them know, and she's engaged. <laughs> That's right, Joe. If you're watching this, I'm coming for you. No, I'm kidding. I love Joe. He's a great guy. I love you so much. Can't wait for your wedding. But for me, um, this big brother lifestyle and personality has not been confined to 
the context of my blood family. I feel like it's actually seeped into uh, my church family as well, a.k.a. you, and, and, and other people that I get to do life with and pursue together Jesus. And I'm sorry, that didn't make sense. I'm trying to get back used to preaching again, and my words are out of order. All right, thank you. I love you. My... <laughs> You see, for me, I have this personality where friends become family, and that for me, uh, there's no such thing as strangers. There's only friends I haven't met in this, in this world. Everybody's my friend. I just haven't met everyone yet. They, they just don't know it yet. I, I need to inform them of this. Um, but this is how I feel in the church culture. This is how I feel... Um, Pretty much everywhere I go, my friends might look somewhat like yours. I have friends who um, are far wiser and far more experienced in the Christian faith than me. I have friends, many of you even, who are in a similar place in their faith experience and in their faith journey. I also have friends who have just recently placed their faith in Jesus, maybe a year or two ago, maybe even sooner than that, maybe even this year. Um, I also have a bunch of friends who don't actually attend here and who actually don't attend anywhere and that have not placed their faith in Jesus, at least not yet. I pray to Jesus that they will in my lifetime. I love to see that. Um, but I have tons of friends that are outside of the church walls as well that, that don't believe in Jesus, that have not placed their faith in him. And I've loved being the big brother for all these people in each of these four categories. I've loved being the big brother. I've loved being the guy that gives encouragement and words of advice, not only from my personal experience, but more importantly, what God tells us in his word. I've also loved telling people what not to do based on personal experience and mistakes. And probably the only thing that gets me more peeved than when someone hits on my wife or sister is when I've seen Christians, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, probably with good intentions, place what should be the joys of godly living on new believers or non-believers in burdensome ways. From my observation, for some people that are doing this, it hasn't even been a joy to pursue godly living for them. But a heavy birdie that a heavy burden that has limited their options and their mindset, which I believe is a false mindset, if I might add. Yet I've seen Christians expect non-Christians to live to God's holy new way of living when they don't even have the Holy Spirit inside them to help non-believers live that way. So these new believers or unbelievers are actually not attracted to God's grace, but are repelled by it sometimes, maybe by good intentions again. But regardless, I've seen this happen. Here are some examples. I literally have brought friends to church before, here in other places, and yeah, they might not look all cleaned up like you and me, although you might be looking at me and you're like, you really don't look cleaned up. Have you seen your jeans? But that's actually been a stumbling block for people in the church. Something as stupid as ripped jeans. I've literally seen people talk to friends who maybe aren't dressed appropriately. I've literally had people in my church life that I know were maybe doing stuff on Saturday night that we would be ashamed about and that they're ashamed about too. And they came in looking a little bit disheveled on Sunday morning and they get in and somebody says, you're not dressed appropriate for church. I have not seen those friends back at church once. I've also seen people that just placed their faith in Jesus, that just did it. Maybe they're even a, what we call baby Christians, a year or two into their faith. Yet we expect them to talk, act, and walk exactly like Jesus. I have one friend that placed his faith in Jesus. He was like about a year into it. And yeah, he still had a dirty mouth. 
And he let a word slip in church one time, and somebody like got down on him of, whoa, what did you just say? And just put so much shame on this friend that just recently placed his faith in Jesus. And I'm, my friend was baffled. Thank God he actually, we, we had a really good conversation. He's come back. But I ended up pulling this older gentleman aside, and I was like, yo, Hubert, like, cool it, man. His name wasn't Hubert. I just made that up. I'm like, cool it, dude. Like, man, if only you can show my friend how patient God has been with you. How patient he's been with me. And you know what? I say all this to say I feel for Paul a bit in this letter to the church in Galatia because I think that's a frustration that he had too. Paul was upset with people that have been in the church for a while that were getting salvation and sanctification confused. He wants everyone to know then and everyone to know now that the cross of Jesus is enough. And it's not a way, it's not a truth, it's not a life. It is the way, it is the truth, and it is the life. And people should be drawn to the life that Jesus has set before us. Not burdened by it, not ashamed by it, not condemned by it. So here's what he says in Galatians chapter 1. That's setting up for the next six weeks. This is Paul's heart, Galatians chapter 1. Verse 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia, holla! He doesn't say that. I just thought it would be fun. This is important, though. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's so good. The good news boiled down, grace and peace. God has grace and peace in store for you. That's why it's good news. Anyway, we'll continue. Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So normally after this part in Paul's other letters, he gets into like this big exhortation. In some letters, he's like, oh my goodness, every time I think of you, I just break out in praise. I pray highly and think highly of you, like all these different things. No, he jumps right into it here. He goes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. He uses some other language there. He's literally saying, damn them. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. He says it again. And then he ends with this verse in in verse 10 for tonight's reading. He says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I'm calling tonight's message gospel teasers and people pleasers. For those of you taking notes, gospel teasers and people pleasers. And we're going to Just talk really briefly for the time we have left on what does this mean? What is Paul talking about here? I think that the first thing that he's saying, that the whole basis of this message is don't add an asterisk to where Jesus has placed an exclamation point. Don't add an asterisk to where Jesus has placed an exclamation point. In John 19, verse 30, Three of the most powerful words ever communicated to the world are by Jesus on the cross. He says these words, it is finished, with a big exclamation point. Yet what these Judaizers are doing here, what the legalistic Christians are doing here, is they took out this exclamation point and added an asterisk. Oh, it's not quite finished. Yeah, the message is a little bit too good to be true. 
And Paul's like, no, it's completely true. Yeah, it's extremely good, but it's extremely true. And you cannot add to it. There is no fine print to Jesus' message. It is finished. So what the Judaizers were trying to tell these non-Jewish Christians is that they had to follow Jewish practices and customs to be saved. I'm going to have a sweet volunteer come up in just a moment. Where is my friend Heather? Come on up, friend. So it's been pretty, it's been warming up lately, which is a good thing. I think it's finally starting to feel like summer. It's good. You know what? It's, it's come early. Memorial Day weekend is like the unofficial start of summer. And nothing is better on a hot summer day than a cold glass of lemonade. Am I right? All right. So I'm going gonna, gonna to try some of this before you. Oh, yeah, that's good stuff. Oh, ooh, that felt good. All right, here we go. Maybe a little bit too much sugar. Um, it's all good. But <laughs> let's, let's play this out a little bit. So the gospel, just play with me. The gospel is like a cold drink of lemonade on a hot summer day. It's refreshing. It's sweet. It's so good. It is rejuvenating in a lot of ways. Oh my gosh, this is really good. And what Paul is saying is, so I presented you the gospel, and what I have in this is some expired milk. Expired milk. It's, it's oh, it's, wow. And so I have some expired milk here. And Paul, which we'll see in a little bit too, he says that the, the law, the, the Torah, the old covenant, was like milk, it was good, but it's actually expired now because of the cross of Christ. So these Judaizers came in, and the gospel was presented to the church in Galatia. And these Judaizers came in with their expired milk, and were like, all right, in order for you to be a Christian, you got to eat some certain foods. In order for you to be a Christian and to be saved through faith, you need, to, you need to observe certain holidays that we observe. And they kept adding and adding and adding and adding. And they called this the gospel. They said that this was a gospel. But as you and I can see, Heather, can you taste this for me and tell me if that's lemonade? She said cheers. <laughs> Did you actually take any? I, I don't think you actually had any. How good, how good is that lemonade? Would you consider this lemonade? It's not your favorite. No, it's not lemonade. <laughs> it's not her favorite drink. Thank you. You could take a seat. You're done here. Took one for the team. I'm so glad for your chill personality. It's not my favorite, she said. Quote her on that. <laughs> So Paul is saying, you, you took the gospel, which was good news, and you thought you were doing the right thing by adding stuff to it, but actually what you've done, this is no gospel at all. This is not refreshing at all. This is going to make your stomach turn. This is going to not refresh. This is disgusting. It's literally, it's chunking up on the bottom. It's, it's gross. I, maybe I should have given you some of that bottom, Heather. Oh, I'm not going to do it. My wife is pregnant, and she said, please do not drink that because I will pay the consequence of that later. You, can, you could connect the dots there. So Paul, in this letter, is rightfully offended and livid. 
and livid because works by men can't save us, only Jesus can. That has been the message all along. And it doesn't matter if you had good efforts or good intentions, it is only the good grace of Jesus that saves us. And it always has been. And it really, truly is that simple. So that's the first part of the verses for tonight. The next part, and this is where I was really challenged this week too, is to check my motives. Ben, you guys can come back up, by the way. Check your motives. Are you serving yourself, pleasing people, or glorifying God? These are questions I had to ask myself this week. Are you serving yourself, pleasing people, or glorifying God? I, my challenge for us this week is to break people-pleasing. That doesn't mean stop being kind to people. I think that that's a great thing, and this is a good thing. We should be loving, but we need to stop trying to please people that aren't even paying attention anyway. Paul says in verse 10, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So here's where this hit home for me this week. What are your motives behind your spiritual walk with Jesus? Heart check. What are your motives? I'll list three things. Why do you serve? First of all, do you serve? That's a more important question. Pastor Steve hit it early this morning. He said, serving is not a suggestion, but a command from Jesus. But why do you serve? Is it for us here? Is it for your friends or is it for God? 1 Corinthians 10, 34, it says, now whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Serving. Is it to get noticed? Is it to make yourself feel better? Or is it for God? Why do you pray? Tread preached a fire sermon the other week on prayer. Do you pray just to check off a task on your daily routine? Or is it to genuinely grow in your relationship and friendship with the living God? I know that for both of these things I mentioned so far, I've been guilty of these things like today alone. Now, why do you read scripture? Why do you own a Bible? Is it to have deep, insightful posts that people will be impressed with on Instagram or Twitter? Or is it to discern God's still active voice a little bit better? to properly align your life decisions to how God designed life to be. Checking your motives, right? Am I trying to serve myself? Am I trying to please people? Or am I glorifying God? See, I think that sometimes we get it backwards in the sense where we need to be known for our public service but Jesus is more about the secret service, the things that happen behind closed doors, the random acts of kindness that nobody else notices and that nobody will know came from you. These are things that Christ cares about a little bit more. And to wrap things up, what's so neat in these verses, and not just in my own life, but Paul, in these 10 verses, is the big brother that is saying, learn from my mistakes. And we'll hear again more about Paul's testimony next week. But Paul used to promote a message contrary to the gospel of Jesus. Paul used to try to please people. And he's here saying, guys, that's no way to live. That's not living at all. That's bondage. That's not freedom. That's bondage. Will you stand with me as we pray and about to continue back into some songs? Jesus, I pray that we will 
keep your really, really good news really, really good in our lives. Jesus, I pray that we recognize that there's nothing we can do or not do. to earn your grace. As one song that we sing says, I don't deserve it. I couldn't earn it. Still, you gave your life away. Jesus, that can't be more true. Thank you so much, Lord, that you choose to pour out your love to us even when we've made mistakes. God, that our missteps don't catch you off guard. That you're more concerned with our next step than our back steps. Jesus, I also pray that you will help us grow as a community. Not to please people which is rooted in insecurity in trying to get your significance from people that will like or dislike you, but secure in our calling, secure in our sonship and daughtership as your children, Lord, that we will know we get to live for you. We don't have to do this. We get to do this. God, I pray that we will steward both tonight and each and every day to the best of our abilities because you grant us with a fresh 24 hours every day. God, so as we continue in worship right now, I pray that you will be our sole desire. Not the applause of man. May we continue to be pleasing to you. In your name, Jesus.